Please turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 6, and our text for today is verses 1 through 8, as well as verses 16 through 18. So Matthew chapter 6, beginning to read in verse 1, this is the word of the living God. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then at this point, Jesus makes a digression and teaches on how we should pray, and we will look at that next week. And then He picks up on His theme again in verse 16 uh, through 18. And he says, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your feet, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Indeed, your word is truth, and we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth at this time. Lord, I ask that your spirit um, would just be manifested in this place in such a powerful way that you would use me as an instrument in your hand to communicate your word in a way that is clear and understandable And Lord, I ask that you would seal these truths to our hearts for your glory and for our good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, there is one main lesson in this portion of Scripture that we're looking at today. And the main lesson has to do with our need to live life before an audience of one. We are not to live our lives for for the applause of other people, but for the applause of heaven. And since that is the case, again and again, Jesus underscores the importance of doing things in secret. And he gives us three examples, which are giving, praying, and fasting. And Jesus tells us to give in secret, to pray in secret, and to fast in secret, because your heavenly Father who sees in secret will reward you. There is a sanctity to secrecy, and without this kind of secrecy, there is no true holiness. Now, it is vital to understand uh, that that what Jesus is saying here, um, and it's also important to understand what Jesus is not saying here. He is not saying that your righteousness isn't supposed to be seen by others. He obviously isn't arguing that you only need to be righteous when no one is around, but then when other people are around, you don't need to be righteous. Uh, This is not on a collision course with what Jesus has already spelled out earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, where he said, let our light so shine before others, that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, is about showing the world who we are so that God would be praised. 
And Matthew chapter 6 is about showing other people more than what we are so that we would be praised. And that is what Jesus said we need to beware of. If your goal is to live for the applause of other people, then have at it. But that is the only reward that you will receive. And what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his own soul? Is it really worth it to have the world love you, like you, applaud you, and revere you, and reward you, and holds you in high esteem if it means forfeiting your soul and giving up the reward that comes from the maker of heaven and earth? And so you can see how this idea of secrecy, that is doing righteous acts in secret, is so important because without it, we will receive no reward from our heavenly Father. But when we do live in this way, God sees our heart and knows our heart, and he will reward us for it. Ultimately, this kind of piety is a matter that touches the heart, and only God sees the heart. However, there are certain kinds of actions and attitudes that serve as pretty good indicators as to whether we are just uh, uh, whether we are a spiritually minded person or whether uh, we are just trying to be spiritual show-offs. And when it comes to these acts of righteousness, Jesus is in effect saying. Be careful here. Be cautious. Now, like I said, verse 1 is the main lesson. It is the main principle. And therefore, verse 1 is to guide the way we interpret the following sections. And verses 2 through 4, verses 5 through 8, and verses 16 through 18 are the examples Jesus gives to establish his point back in verse 1. So let's begin with looking at Jesus' first example, which is about almsgiving. In verse 2, Jesus says, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. The Bible has always held out the importance of giving to those in need. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11, it says, For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. Giving to help someone out glorifies God. But giving to promote yourself dishonors God because giving is to be an act of worship. And if your giving is to draw attention to yourself, then you are really worshiping yourself. That's why Jesus said, when you give, don't sound a trumpet. Don't set off a public alarm so that others can know uh, what you are about to give. Now, when Jesus spoke about not sounding the trumpet, he may have been speaking literally, but I think it is more probable that he was speaking metaphorically. In the ancient world, trumpets were used for various purposes. Uh, They were used as musical instruments. Uh, They were used to make signals in warfare. Uh, Trumpets were also used to call attention um, for public events and to announce specific times of worship. Well, some have suggested that the call of the trumpet in this case was to signal that there was an urgent financial need at the Jerusalem temple. And if that was the case, then it would provide a wonderful opportunity for someone who was living in that town to close down their shop, rush to the temple, and contribute to the need so that they could receive all the recognition before all the watching citizens. Well, that is a possibility. But I think Jesus has something more modest in mind and a little less specific because he mentions giving in the synagogues and on the streets. In other words, when Jesus mentions synagogues, that touches on the ecclesiastical and religious sphere. And when he mentions streets, he has the public square in mind. And his point is that wherever you are and whatever you give, sound no trumpet. So to sound the trumpet simply means to draw attention to oneself. It is giving for the sake of getting. 
It is giving to get something else in return. And such giving flows out of a heart of a selfish giver, not a generous giver. But when the generous giver um, sees a need, he or she gives for the sake of truly helping another person out. Jesus' point here is that secret giving is not seen by others. So give in that way, because if you do, then you're obviously not giving to be seen by other people and to be praised by other people. Now, when this is born in mind, it shows us how Jesus' teaching here doesn't necessarily mean that it is always wrong to give openly. For example, from Acts chapter 4, verses 34 through 37, we know that everyone in the early church was aware of the fact that Barnabas gave his income from the land that he had sold, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. But a sharp contrast from the giving of Barnabas is found in the very next chapter, which was the giving that came from the hands of Ananias and Sapphira. They sold their property too, and they also gave, but they did not give all the proceeds from their sale. Now, they also weren't under any obligation to give all the money away. The problem was that they said they did. And they said what they did because they really wanted the applause of the church. They wanted to hear the members say, Oh, Ananias and Sapphira, you're such generous givers, and you have such a sacrificial love to, to give all the proceeds for the land that you sold. You see, they were motivated to give in order to be seen by others. Otherwise, they wouldn't have lied about it. I mean, they could have just said, look, we sold our property and we would like to contribute half of the proceeds to the church to be used for any needs that there might be. And that would have been very, very generous and totally acceptable. But because they wanted to seem more sacrificial than they really were, they lied and God took them out because of it. Now, it's important to also note that giving doesn't just apply to giving money. We are to give ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And at times that may mean giving some cash away, but at other times it may mean giving our time away. It may be having someone over for dinner. But even when we give in those ways, we need to beware of giving so as to be praised by others, right? So say you have someone over and you just want to make everything so spectacular. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with making everything very nice. But are you motivated to serve him who sees in secret? Or are you just looking to impress others? It's really the same thing for those in ministry, in fact, constantly being in the presence of the public eye as a preacher can make it a real temptation to do things and to say things for the praise of men. And I don't just mean tickling people's ears by telling them what they want to hear. It can even be saying bold and fiery things that may be true. But maybe it's being said because of knowing that some people are just wanting to hear an explosive message every Sunday. You can tickle people's ears in order to receive praise from others, but it is naive to think that you can't preach the truth in order to be praised by others, because you can. And the fact of the matter is that God sees our hearts, and we will all answer to him. You see, this can be applied to all sorts of things in life, which means that we must always beware of doing anything for self-glorification. Naturally speaking, that is, in and of ourselves, we give and serve for the praise of other people. And it is only by God's supernatural power that we will give and serve for the praise of God alone. Any offerings we give to others are to be an act of worship to God. And since giving is about worship, then our giving must flow out of a heart of love for God and love for for other people. It is not about how much we give, it is about the motive and the manner in which we give. A giving so that God would be praised is very different than giving so that you would be praised, and it's the difference between maturity and carnality. 
It's the difference between true spirituality and hypocrisy. But Jesus said, don't be like those hypocrites. And by the way, a hypocrite is anyone who puts on a mask. It is someone who pretends to be someone they are not. Well, the Pharisees gave the appearance of being generous, but in reality, they were very greedy. I just saw Gordon laughing there, and I know what he was thinking about. We're all wearing masks right now, so we ought to be careful. Putting on a mask and pretending to be someone you are not is okay in the theater. Because everyone knows that it's just for pretend. Everyone knows that it's just a show. But when you put on a mask outside of the theater to conceal your identity, it is hypocrisy. That's why in verse 3, Jesus said, When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. D.A. Carson says, It is almost as if the master is using an overwhelming metaphor to express adequately just how quiet and private our giving ought to be. For the left hand, to be ignorant of what the right hand is doing is to essentially say that when we give, we should scarcely know that we have given. Pride is nurtured when we reflect on how much we have given. Humility is nurtured when we reflect on how much God has given us. And humble giving is the kind of giving that gives so freely. To freely give is to give out of the outflow of your heart, and it is natural, and it just kind of happens. You see a need, your heart is burdened, and you contribute towards it, and you just move on. You just kind of forget about it. It's not something you just keep thinking about, nor do you have regrets uh, about giving what you gave. You're just happy that you were able to help, and you move on, and the cycle repeats itself, and someone comes up later on in the future, and you give again, and it's just a repeated cycle that continues to happen over and over again. And friends, I want to tell you, there are probably so many people in this life that you have helped And so many things that you have given, whether it has been resources or money or time or anything else, and you just can't remember all of it. You've probably forgotten about many of the things that you've done that has extremely blessed other people over the years. But although your left hand has scarcely paid attention to what your right hand has been up to, God has had his eye on both hands. And he has not forgotten because he sees those who gives in secret and he will reward them. Well, Jesus moves from almsgiving to speak about prayer in verses 5 through 8. Now, before Jesus tells us how we are to pray, which is found later in the model prayer, which is also famously known as the Lord's Prayer, at this point he is teaching us how not to pray. And in verse 5 he says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. In the first century setting, it was a customary practice for a member of the congregation to stand and publicly pray in the synagogue during the service. And this responsibility was an opportunity for a man to be tempted to pray merely to be heard by others. And so you know how it is, you know, using lofty words and acceptable cliches and having the right tone and a well-pitched voice could all be used as a way of gaining approval and praise. But I think what one commentator has said is right. I don't think we should be too hard on the Jews of Jesus' day before examining ourselves thoroughly because we can all easily fall prey to the temptation of trying to be someone that we are not. You know, early on in ministry, this was a little bit of a struggle for me. I was under the delusion that I would be a better preacher if I just tried to almost mimic certain patterns of other preachers, you know, have the same kind of tone, use similar terminology. 
But I had to come to grips with the reality that God has given me a personality that is utterly unique. So why on earth would I try to be someone else? Now, it's one thing to want to learn from others, but it's quite another to want to be them. Jesus is against painting ourselves with a certain posture of piety that is a mere facade. And so a good principle to keep in mind is this. When you pray publicly, does it reflect the way you pray privately? Now, I am not saying there is no distinction between private and public prayer. Private prayer will be a little more personal compared to when we pray corporately. But when you pray before others, are you just overly concentrating on uttering expressions that are fashionable? Or is it an overflow from your own praying in secret? Because if you can pray in secret, you really shouldn't have a problem praying in public before others. In fact, the best way to learn how to pray in public is to pray in secret. Look at what Jesus says in verse 6. He says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, Jesus is not saying that praying before others is wrong. In fact, in, the Lord, in our Lord's model prayer, it begins with saying, Our, our Father who, it, uh, who art in heaven. Well, you only need to say our if you are praying together. And moreover, Jesus also prayed before other people, and we know that the early ch- church lifted up their voices together in prayer. So Jesus is not against praying with other people. He is against praying so as to be heard and praised by other people. And that is the point of verse 6. Because think about it. If you go into your room and open the closet and shut the door, are you really praying to be seen? Well, unless you have people hanging out in your closet, then I guess this won't apply. But for the rest of us, When we get alone with God, you are only praying before an audience of one, and such prayer is flowing out of a desire to be heard by God alone. That is how we are to pray at all times. Now, in verse 7, Jesus gives another warning. He says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. You know, there are some places where we can be tempted to be spiritual show-offs and other places where we can be tempted to hide our spirituality. So let, let me put it this way. If you're called upon to pray at a church picnic and you give a great theological exposition in your very, very long-winded prayer that is so rich it would dazzle angels, but then... <laughs> Pray completely differently when you're at a restaurant with your family and something is wrong. Kevin DeYoung said something very wise. He said, we are to hide when we are tempted to show. And we must show when we are tempted to hide. When we are tempted to pull back from the world because of fear, we need to step forward in faith and show But when we are tempted to show how good we are before the church, we need to step back in humility and hide. But wherever you are, just be who you are in Christ and seek to grow in Him. And don't utter a bunch of mumbo-jumbo that even you know is worthless. Don't be like those Gentiles. Now, in the non-Jewish world, it was believed that all uh, the various gods of these Gentiles would respond to their prayers uh, by using much repetition. And consequently, their prayers were characterized by magical incantations. And it was nothing but vain babbling. But Jesus said, don't let your praying be like that, because don't you know that your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him? You know, sometimes when we pray, we can treat God as though he's some kind of genie, as if using many words will get us many things, or the more we ask, the more we will get. A way we approach God can sometimes be more childish than it is childlike. But that 
is the kind of attitude that a Gentile has when they approach their so-called gods. It is always give me, give me, give me. And furthermore, the purpose of prayer among the Gentiles is really a kind of mindset that is focused on educating God as though he might be ignorant of something that you need to convince him of. But that is anti-Christian. Because our God already knows everything before we even ask. You see, ultimately, prayer does not change God. It changes you. So don't pray as though God needs you. Pray as though you need him. Well, let's look at Jesus' last example, which is on fasting. In verse 16, he said, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Fasting is the practice of abstaining from food for spiritual reasons. It was a way of opening oneself up to God, and it was often accompanied by grief over sin. Uh, Fasting is a way of depending upon God, and it involved prayer, repentance, and seeking God's guidance. In the Jewish calendar, there were days of fasting that everyone would participate in, such as the Day of Atonement. So at times there there would be a national fast, but at other times individuals would fast for reasons related to self-discipline. We know that Jesus fasted, Moses fasted, Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah to seek the Lord when their enemy was coming to make war against them. David fasted when he heard that Saul had died, when Haman issued an edict to have all the Jews killed. The Jews wept and fasted over their destiny, and the people of Israel fasted in the days of Nehemiah to confess their sins. So you can see how there are many reasons why someone might fast. Maybe it's just to depend upon the Lord so that more time can be devoted to seeking Him. Because fasting really teaches you in an experiential way what it means to not live by bread alone, but to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And let me tell you, fasting can be tough. I remember one morning... When we were in New Brunswick, I got up, prayed to the Lord, and told him that I was going to fast and that I needed his help. And that morning I was doing quite well. But not long thereafter, my brother came to our house and just so happened to have a nice sloppy pizza in his hands. So I said to myself, maybe I'll fast after lunch. Okay, so I'm not the greatest example to follow in this area. But the Bible assures us that fasting is a good thing to do because when you do it, you realize how weak and how needy you are. And that doesn't mean that you need to, you know, start with a week-long fast. Uh, I don't know if you fasted before, but, you know, it just begins in baby steps. Maybe fast today. Maybe fast for a meal or two. You know, maybe it would be good if you fasted from something other than food. Maybe you need to fast from watching TV. Maybe you need to fast from Facebook. But whatever you choose to abstain from, it doesn't mean that you need to fast from all of those things forever. Fasting is a way to get us depending on God, and it is a sign of humility. But as you know, outward symbols of humility can very easily be prostituted and give rise to occasions for vanity. And that is why Jesus said this in verse 17 and 18. He said, But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus' point here is that when you fast, make Sure, you look normal. Because you know what someone is going to do when they fast, right? They're going to make themselves look like they have just got out of the jungle. Like they've just came back from the mountains because they've been wrestling with God. And so what happens? They come back and they're dirty. Maybe they smell a little bit funny and have an unsavory, gloomy kind of demeanor about them because they have been wrestling with God. 
but it is all a pretense and it is hypocrisy. It is trying to give the indication that you are more spiritual than you really are. And Jesus is saying, don't be so foolish. Clean yourself up. Put some deodorant on and just be normal. That's what he means by anointing your head and washing your face. You see, fasting is an opportunity for you to depend upon God, not an opportunity for you to parade your depth of devotion. And again, it's not that anybody cannot be aware of the fact that you are fasting, if you are fasting. But beware and be cautious that you are not just practicing your righteousness before others in order to be praised. When you fast, Be as normal as you are when you eat. And think about it. You may tell someone you're going to grab a bite to eat, but I can guarantee you that you're not telling them that because you think it makes them look spiritual. I mean, if I told you, you know, after church today, I'm going to be going to McDonald's to grab a burger, you wouldn't be thinking to yourselves, oh, our pastor, he's just so holy. He's so set apart. He's going for a double Big Mac, right? (laughs) I mean, you you wouldn't think that. And it's the same mentality we should have with fasting. If we don't boast when we eat, then we shouldn't boast when we fast. When you eat, eat unto the Lord. And when you fast, fast unto the Lord. But whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, do it all for the glory of God. Well, there is one last thing I would like to bring to your attention from this passage. These Religious practices that Jesus speaks of is something that he expects us to put into practice. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Look at verse 2. Jesus said, when you give to the needy. Verse 5, when you pray. And verse 16, when you fast. You see, Jesus assumes that we will be doing these kinds of things because we are his followers. So the cure to hypocritical giving and hypocritical praying and hypocritical fasting is not to stop giving, stop praying, and stop fasting. It's to stop with all the hypocrisy and all the showiness and self-righteousness because when you act that way, you are elevating yourself and belittling your Savior. But our giving and our praying and our fasting pales in comparison to how much Jesus gave and how much Jesus prayed, and how much Jesus fasted. So how dare we put ourselves on the front stage? And if that's all you're interested in, if you just want the front stage and the praise of men, well, have at it. But that's all you are going to get. On the other hand, if your audience is not the people of this world, but it is the Lord God Almighty, and you live your life to glorify Him from the bottom of your heart, then you will get far, far more than what any man could ever give you. Now, when you walk on this path, it's also important to know that you may hardly get any recognition from others, and perhaps none at all. But the good news is that you will be recognized by God. And that is far better. For our Father, who sees in secret, He will reward you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is our desire, Lord, to put these things into practice in our own lives and to truly live lives of secret righteousness where we have a real, vibrant relationship with you, where we are first and foremost seeking to please you. And so, God, as we have meditated on the sanctity of secrecy today, Lord, I just ask that you would, Lord, just expose any hypocrisy, any showiness, any self-righteousness that may have crept into our hearts and that you would bring it to the surface, that we would repent and be restored and forgiven. God, we thank you so much for the richness of your grace. You are so kind and so good, and we worship you for who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.